parents would react. Well, babies had a very clear, reliable preference between these two people. They stayed away from uh, the guy who pushed uh, the uh, little girl. They actually looked at that person longer, suspiciously, uh, and interacted much more readily, taking a toy, for example, from the uh, person who hit the backpack. Um, this is, it's very early days for this kind of research, but I think it converges with the cross-cultural studies, suggesting that the reason we see universality in uh, uh, moral evaluations of actions across widely divergent cultures in adults may well be because there is a system of knowledge that's emerging early in development uh, that we're all equipped with that allows us to grow up in any of these cultures um, and uh, express this moral uh, system in different ways. Well, given these universal systems, I think we now have, we next have to ask, where does human variability come from? Why don't we all speak the same language and listen to the same music and, and it, it, it live in the same, exactly the same kinds of family arrangements and so forth? Well, I think part of this variability comes from another universal human capacity, which is our capacity to combine together uh, distinct core concepts freely and productively. To give you a couple examples uh, to give a feel for this phenomenon, I think it, it's very likely that tool use develops from an ability to combine together representations of objects as mechanical bodies with representations of goal-directed actions so that you can come to see an object as, at one and the same time, a material body that participates in a set of uh, uh, human-determined uh, intentions. Similarly, exact natural number representations may result from our capacity to combine representations of numerically distinct individual objects, precise representations of small numbers of objects, with the large approximate number representations that I was talking about a minute ago. Now, some of the research that I've done and that um, some other people have done suggests that this combinatorial capacity may be tied to natural language. That's a controversial suggestion. It may turn out to be wrong. What I think is clear is that this capacity is unique to humans uh, and it's universal across humans and it may be at the root of many of the diverse variable um, systems that we see uh, in different human societies. Well, if all of this is true, uh, that is, if we're all equipped with a common stock of uh, core knowledge systems and a common capacity to freely combine uh, concepts uh, from different core systems together, then it would seem that humans might be gripped by a tremendous illusion, the illusion that different members of different groups really are fundamentally different from one another. And as I was saying before, I think this illusion may be one of the forces, certainly not the only one, um, but one of the forces that, leads, that has led in the past to wars and social divisions that feeds ethnic conflicts today that may inure us in some cases to reports of torture and human rights violations that take place uh, in foreign lands. Now, this illusion of fundamental human differences may have two different sources. These are not mutually exclusive. They could both be at work. First, as the psychologist Larry Hirschfeld uh, has suggested, it may partly be learned by a pattern of false induction uh, from uh, other kinds of categories. So for example, Hirschfeld has suggested that children may learn that when two animals, for example, uh, look very different and behave in very different ways. They're very likely to be members of different species. And from that, they may overgeneralize this learning uh, to the human case. But a, a second um, possible contributor to this illusion could be a predisposition that's actually present in us as humans at an early age. And we don't have a lot of evidence that this is true, but I think we're starting to see some tiny hints that it might be true. Let me tell you about just one new experiment by my student, uh, Katie Kinsler, at Harvard, which has looked at how infants react to people who speak different languages. What she did in this study, she took quite young infants, six-month-olds who aren't yet talking or understanding much of, uh, of anything that's uh, being said to them, and she presented them with two people who were, in fact, Spanish-English bilingual speakers. But for any given infant, one of these two people spoke to the infant in English, and the other spoke to the infant in Spanish. Then the two people were presented side by side, very much like the Dupu and Jacob study I told you about, and they try to engage the child, and you look at how the child reacts. Now, in this sample of children, they all came from uh, 
uh, families where the language spoken at home was English. What she found was a real difference in their orientation to these two people. Even though unlike the Jacques Cub studies, the people weren't doing anything objectively different, the kids were oriented more positively toward the person who had previously spoken to them in English than toward the person who had previously spoken to them in Spanish. This is, it's really too soon to draw large conclusions from this, but I think it at least begins to suggest that early in development, children may already be using some of these superficial differences between people, like uh, the uh, sound pattern of their native lang uh, language, as indicators of group membership. Uh, may be, we could be seeing here, I think, the beginnings of tendencies to categorize people as us versus them. Well, if there's anything to these speculations, I think they suggest that two aspects of human nature may pose a challenge uh, for us, both for, uh, for our future and for the enterprise uh, of extending human rights around the world. One is our surface variability, and the other is our tendency to take this surface variability much too seriously and infer falsely from it uh, that the uh, variability runs deep. But I think a third aspect of our human nature is actually the most fundamental at all and holds the potential key to a remedy to this problem. That is the combinatorial capacity that allows us to articulate uh, deeply entrenched notions and criticize them and get beyond them. Now, we see this capacity at work in the history of science in a case that uh, Chomsky has discussed a lot in other contexts, though he didn't mention it today, uh, in the development changing notions of bodies with the um, revolution in um, Newtonian mechanics. Now, the core conception of objects that we find in infants and that we find in intuitive thinking all uh, around the world uh, is uh, centers on, among other things, a constraint that objects can act on each other only on contact. But of course, as we all know in the history of science, uh, that turned out not to provide uh, a very workable description of object mo motion, either on Earth uh, uh, or um, in uh, uh, astronomy. And what happened is that by combining other core concepts together, particularly concepts of space and number, uh, Newton was able to come up with a better account of uh, object mechanics that clashes with the core conception that we hold, but that nevertheless was able to serve as a foundation for the, develop the further development of uh, science and technology, and did so for centuries until, of course, that theory was replaced by even more counterintuitive uh, notions of bodies. Now, I think in the case of human rights, a similar process uh, may be evident. We have the capacity to recognize that our notions of human differences are wrong. And the dawning recognition of human universals, I think, can already be seen in the history of uh, the human rights movement from the very early days where it was confined to relatively narrow circles of people through the progressive extensions to the current universal uh, declaration of human rights, which applies to everyone. However this notion clashes with entrenched beliefs, it has been articulated and it can be uh, implemented. Of course, societies whose laws and practices violate this principle are far more common today, as Professor Chomsky's examples uh, illustrate, than societies whose uh, technologies violate uh, Newtonian or quantum mechanics. And I think it's important to ask why it might be that insights in this domain are so much harder to grasp and put into action than are uh, new insights uh, in the domain of physics. Now, in part, I think this may well be because of the manipulative effects of government and media that uh, Chomsky uh, has so well described. But in part, I think it also may be because reasoning about other people engages our emotions in a way that reasoning about apples and bricks does not. Uh, and that can make the task of overcoming uh, core conceptions uh, more difficult. Finally, in part, I think it may just be because cognitive science is less developed as a discipline than physics is, and the work I was talking about today has for the most part, not entirely, but for the most part a much shorter history uh, than um, uh, the history of insights in physics. In any case, I think that one challenge that we face now as a species is to see 
our universal human nature through its variable manifestations, and then to craft political institutions that build on this insight. And uh, to end with the word and again, I actually think that both the disciplines of linguistics and of uh, human rights uh, are giving us our best starting points here. some things that I've been sort of curious about. Um, one, we taught, um, Professor Chomsky, your talk, you 